Hello and welcome to the Leathercraft Masterclass Q&A sessions with me, Phil. And in this episode, I'm gonna be going through 10 questions, which is two more questions than the last time, all about Leathercraft that you've sent me from Instagram Lives, which reminds me, if you're not following me on Instagram, at Leathercraft Masterclass, make sure you follow me there because there's loads of great content that you might be missing out of if you're only following me on YouTube. And also remember there's now a free guide for you guys, which I will link up here and down here. And with those two resources, they're gonna help you a lot with deciding on your leather and deciding what tools you need for your projects to give you the absolute best outcome possible. Now in this session, I'm going to be asking 10 questions and those 10 questions are, how to sharpen an edge beveler? Number one, difference between fully glued leather linings and a lining glued at the edges. Pros and cons of re-tanned leather, when to use it over chrome or vegetable tan. Advice on using chrome tan leather with vegetable tan leather in the same project, so a combination, which is cool. What do you think about leather alternatives, vegan leathers, bee leaf, etc.? Overview of non-leather linings, canvas, silk, linen, etc. How long did it take you to develop your skills at the level you wanted to work at? What is the best lighting setup for a workshop besides sunlight? What is the difference between handmade and craftsmanship? And how to properly store your hides to prevent mold growth and not lose the natural smell of leather. Very important there but I'm also gonna be taking questions from Instagram Live, so there might be a few popping up on there. And also I'm gonna be going probably on many different tangents talking about lots of different things. So yes, below on the timeline, you can skip along to the question you want me to answer the most, uh, but don't forget to try and watch as much of it as you can because it's always, there's always gonna be something new for you to learn there and it's free advice, which is the best kind really, isn't it? Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and go live now on Instagram and then we can get started on the questions. Alrighty, so yeah, a lot of questions. Uh, last week, oh, last week, last month, I'm doing these monthly now, I uh, did eight questions. Uh, this time is a super 10 questions, so uh, we can't be too slow about getting through it. Cool, right, so question and answers. These are your questions. A lot of them are multiples, as in a lot of people ask the same thing or the same kind of thing. So I'll be trying to cover as many of the questions as possible. So. What is question number one? Now question number one is how to sharpen an edge beveler. How to sharpen an edge beveler. Now for those of you who don't know what's an edge beveler, uh, let's see if I can reach over and get one here. A uh, piece of leather, luckily there is one there. So an edge beveler is a small tool like this. Okay, apologies for those of you who already know exactly what these are. But it bevels an edge, it's a very uh, self-descriptive name. So when would you want to bevel an edge? You would bevel an edge on a, on a belt, in saddlery, or anything that's going to get a high level of friction where things are going to be rubbing. Uh, you don't want it to, to catch or wear out prematurely by having a 90 degree sharp edge. So this just knocks the edge off uh, really, really well. Now there's two types. There's one which has a flat blade. So when you take your corner of your leather and you just cut it off, you end up with two more, two more corners essentially. Uh, and then you have these convex or concave, depending on how you look at it, but it's a concave edge, which is a blade which is curved between two guides. So essentially, as you're going across your top edge, it will become rounded. It will curve it naturally, all right? So it helps you to do that. Just makes it easier to burnish as well. So all you have to do is run it along your edge. Is it on frame there? Is it on frame there? Yes, it is. Run it along an edge. On one side, turn it over, do the same thing on the other side. And there you have a rounded radius edge. And then you can go ahead and uh, burnish it if you need to. So the question is, how do you sharpen one rather than what it is? But for those of you who don't know, how would you sharpen one? My recommendation is make sure you check reviews on these. I, I, I don't always insist on having super sharp tools out of the box. A lot of people say uh, the tool has to be sharp. When I open the box, it needs to be ready to go. A skiving knife should skive straight away. A craft knife should cut leather straight away. I don't mind putting my own edge on everything. If it comes butter blunt, I don't mind too much, to be honest with you. I think 
the skill to be able to sharpen is very important. And uh, sometimes when you buy these tools, it gives you a good uh, uh, amount of practice time. But these are one of the tools that I think you should have very sharp out of the box because it's an absolute pain in the ass to sharpen them. Generally speaking, the way I would do it is if you're using a concave edge beveler, I would have uh, a rod, like a steel rod. You can even use like a cocktail stick or a skewer depending on the size, um, but usually a steel rod that's slightly undersized, okay? So it doesn't quite match the concave blade. Then you can place a piece of sandpaper over the top and pull it back. Okay, a few times, and then you can go finer and finer and finer. And that's gonna give you a nice sharp edge, which you can then start polishing by, uh, see if I can get it here, just using a piece of thread. Okay, so this is actually just a piece of string. It's probably about one and a half millimeters. This is a larger, uh, number two, about 1.8 millimeter uh, edge beveler. And I've got some compound on here, green compound, and you just simply pull it through a few times and it's just polishing that blade. And once you've got it polished, it's gonna last an incredibly long time before you really need to sharpen it again with the rod and sandpaper method. So that's the way I normally do it, but my advice would be to check reviews on your edge bevelers and try and go with a brand that really does get it sharp right out of the box so that you don't have to go through that process because it is a bit of a pain and you want a polish on here. You can't just use uh, sandpaper to polish it and then or to sharpen it and then expect it to work well. It, you're pushing a blade perpendicular to the line that you're cutting. So you want a polish blade for that. You can have little micro teeth on there for blades which you're cutting across leather with, okay? So for example, uh, oh, it's over there. In my craft knife, I can use, let me get it for you, otherwise you're not gonna be able to imagine what I'm talking about. So I have a ceramic sharpening rod for this. And this is about around 2000 grit. And it doesn't put a polish on there. What it does is it puts a very micro, not burr, but, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, slightly toothy edge, okay? Slightly toothy edge on there. And that really digs into the leather and cuts through quickly because it's a pull cut, a push cut where you're going straight through the leather. Another example would be uh, a manual splitter, okay? So the blade is along here and you're pulling leather in this direction across it, perpendicular. That's where you would want a high polish. You wouldn't want a toothy blade. Okay, micro serration is the phrase that I'm looking for. Run, Phil, hurry back. Yes, it didn't take me too long. <laughs> but yeah, so this is a push cut. Okay, um, so that's where you want something that's highly polished. So you wouldn't want to just sharpen it on sandpaper. You'd want to make sure that you pulled it through some string with compound. Okay, string should be the similar size or slightly above than the dip or the convex edge on there. Okay, so let's put that back in its place. Reholster it. Uh, lean it back. Serrated edge, yes, yes, serrations, that's correct. Yeah, I say this kind of stuff all the time. As soon as that goes live and that camera is on, it just, <laughs> just goes, it just goes. Talking of which, uh, guys, um, it's okay quality on here on Instagram TV. So this live will be saved on IGTV on my Instagram account. It's okay quality, it's like 480p, 360 or something like that. But it's also gonna be on YouTube in uh, HD. So uh, you can go on there. It's also got better sound quality as well because I've got the lav mic going. And it's also gonna be, for, for both of you, Instagram and YouTubes, uh, it's gonna be on a podcast as well. So this audio gets taken from the video and goes on a podcast so you can listen to me whilst you're in the gym or driving. Cool, right, so that question is done. How to sharpen an edge beveler? Try to avoid it at all costs or use the sandpaper and rod method. Next question, the difference between fully glued leather lining and a lining that is only glued at the edges, okay? So in a lot of bags, are oh, my hands clean? Should I go and get a bag? I don't know, we'll see. On a, depends how well I can explain it. So on a, on a bag that you've made, 
if you want to make a high quality bag, a high end luxury bag is, is almost universally lined with something on the inside. That allows you to work with a different color. It allows you more options with a pocket. It also allows you to use firmer, stiffer, more durable leathers on the outside and then softer linings on the inside, which gives a, a more of a sense of uh, a luxury feel when you put your hand inside. So there are a lot of different benefits uh, to using a lining, which gives a, a completely different feel to your product. So what's the difference? Generally, generally, and this is more of an observation than anything else, um, on more masculine leather goods, such as briefcases, okay, so uh, more traditional saddle leather briefcases, bridle leather briefcases, attache cases, which is the box case, uh, and more gentlemen's bags and accessories, linings tend to be glued directly because it's, it's firmer, it's generally more durable that way as well. And then on more feminine leather goods uh, and cases and bags, handbags, for example, you tend to have a loose lining because it feels softer when you put your hand inside. So if you have the same leather, one is glued in on one side and one is only glued on the, on the edges on the other side, the side that's not fully glued in always feels softer because the leather yields, okay? It moves with your hand as you're moving your hand around and pulling your keys out, I don't know. But the, the side that is glued in directly becomes stiffer inherently because it, it takes on the stiffness of the leather that it's glued to or the reinforcement that it's glued to. Um, but if you glue in a lining fully, you can't have a pocket on the inside of the lining. So these zip pockets that you open on the inside and you put your stuff inside, you can't do that, at least not very well, on a fully glued in lining. What you then have to have is a hanging pocket or make use of dividers, okay, or adding partitions between them, such as you would see on a traditional bridal leather brief, uh, briefcase. So you would partition things off or you would have a hanging pocket, which is just stitched in at the top. So adding a lining adds softness. It also adds the ability to add pockets, which are more covert because they're on the inside of the lining. Um, and it generally makes uh, it feel softer. And also when you glue a lining direct to leather, the whole thing, the structure of the bag itself becomes inherently more stiff. So that's another thing to bear in mind. The lining essentially takes on the characteristics of something you would use as an interlining, something you would use as a reinforcement. So the whole thing becomes stiffer. So that's mainly the difference. You don't have to uh, always glue it in. It really depends on the design. A lot of the time on handbags, I like to keep a loose lining along the panels and the base and a glue in, a full glue in along the gussets. I find that just it, after a long period of time, gussets that are loose, depending on the type of leather you, you're using, can start to feel a little bit loose because they get a lot of uh, they get pulled along a lot. The lining can stretch more before the exterior leather and it just looks a little bit more worn out. So I like to glue in gussets, but again, it really depends on the, uh, the, d the design itself. Atif says, beautiful conversation. Hi from Pakistan. Hello Atif, thank you for joining me. So the difference between fully glued in leather lining and the lining that's only glued, in the, glued at the edges depends on the function, depends on what kind of pockets you want to use, depends on the structure of the bag and also the style. Okay, so the next question is, moving on to the third question, pros and cons of retanned leather. When to use it over chrome and veg tan? Now, the question is, what is retanned leather, okay? Retanned leather, also called combination tanned leather, is leather that has been through the two most common types of tanning, which is vegetable tanning and chrome tanning. So it will end up taking characteristics of both. Essentially, it's, uh, it's, it's a hybrid of the two. So it will be firmer than most chrome tanned leathers, softer than most vegetable tanned leathers, more water resistant, than most uh, vegetable tan leathers and also more wear resistant and with a higher tensile strength than most vegetable tan leathers. So it takes on the best and the worst of both types of leather. It's used quite extensively in the shoemaking industry. I think that's probably where most retan leather goes is the shoemaking industry because 
If used pure chrome, most pure chrome tan leathers can be too soft for making boots and shoes and things like that. You wouldn't want to you know, press the toe and it just completely dips in. You want something that has a little bit of firmness, but a pure vegetable tan leather shoe, you need to condition it a little bit more often to prevent it from cracking. So you know, there are pros and cons and a retan is actually a great combination uh, for shoemaking. But I'm not a professional shoemaker, so I can't confirm those for sure. When do I use it? I, I don't tend to use it very often. Most of the time I'll end up using, you know, chrome tan leather where I need to use chrome tan leather. I want the softness, I want the compressibility, I want the ability to stretch, such as a flipped bag, which usually ends up looking better in, in chrome tan leather. Um, but in certain uh, builds, I will want pure vegetable tan leather. So when would I use retanned? I've only ever bought it once or twice. I, it's, it's not something that really appeals to me. So when would you use it? It's difficult to say. It's probably where you want something that's gonna be a bit more water resistant. Maybe you're making a soft-sided briefcase, and, but you don't want it to be too structured. You want it to have a vegetable tan leather look, but not too stiff. You know, but you have to remember that there are chrome tan leathers that have been treated so that they're quite firm. So they've been finished quite dense and they feel more like veg tan. And there's some veg tan leathers that have been, ad, have their fibers agitated and they feel really soft like chrome tan. So there is a lot of overlapping. There is not like every chrome tan is soft, every veg tan is firm and every retanned is somewhere in between. There is a lot of blurring, blurring of, the, of the lines and it depends on how it's been tanned. It also depends on, a lot on um, the method that uh, they've used to process that leather as well. So the pros and cons of retan leather, it really depends. I don't use it often enough to really have a strong opinion on it, to be honest. Okay, so how are we doing on there? Uh, so we've got a question here. M.A. Dinster says, is tokenol good for chrome tan leather edges? It is possible to get a half decent burnish, or what seems to be a burnish, on, uh, on certain types of retanned or firm vegetable tanned leathers, um, firm chrome tanned leathers. It is possible. You're never gonna get it like, uh, to look like a veg tan leather edge. But tokenol, yeah, I, I have used it, to be fair, on certain chrome tan leathers or, or retan leathers, and it, it does work, but it's, it's not ideal. The best thing to do on chrome tan leather for edges is either edge paint or skive the edge and then do a turned edge, uh, which is probably my preferred method, probably, definitely my preferred method. Right, so fourth question in here, advice for use, okay, there's another chrome tan, there's a lot of different tan edges going in here. Uh, I think it's the last one actually. Advice for using chrome tan leather with veg tan leather in the same project. Okay, so uh, I'll put a picture up on the screen for you guys on YouTube. But uh, in the de Havilland travel bag, you'll notice that the main panels and gussets of the bag, okay, is chrome tanned leather, which I prefer for a bag that's made inside out and then flipped to finish. But there are certain parts that I chose to use vegetable tan leather, okay? And the chrome tan leather that I used was tumbled, so it has a, a very heavy texture. The veg tan that I used was actually English bridal leather, which takes a very nice polish. So I liked having a little bit of contrast. The color was very similar, but you'll notice that the veg tan was a lot more polished and the chrome tan, although very similar in color, was a lot more uh, textured. And sometimes I like to play with textures instead of playing with colors. So that becomes the contrast, the, temp the texture. Um, but generally speaking, I much prefer making handles from pure vegetable tan leather because it just molds better to the hand over time. It takes on the characteristics of your hand better. I think it, it looks better with age and any areas of high wear, although chrome tan leather is very wear resistant, it doesn't look better with age. The best chrome tan leather ever looks, generally speaking, is day one. The best vegetable tan leather ever looks is subjective. Some people like it where it looks clean. Some people like it with a patina. Um, so it has that used look, like you've been places and done things and 
it's picked up a story. Some people like it, some people don't like the patina at all. Okay, it's not universally accepted as the, the, the creme de la creme. Um, but when it comes to veg tan leather, I, I, I do like using parts, especially handles, attachments, and things like that in veg tan. Um, but if I didn't flip the bag, I could have made the whole thing in vegetable tan leather if the stitching was in the outside. And for those of you on YouTube, I'll uh, introduce you to the Buckram Weekender, which is another bag that I did. Um, it's not part of a course, but it was a bag that I made as a prototype for a company in London. Uh, but that was pure vegetable tan leather stitched on the outside. So it really depends on what you're going to make as a bag. Um, the design, what you're going for, the characteristics that you're looking for, that generally comes with experience. So it's no right or wrong, it's just what you've found to be pleasing, uh, your personal preferences, and of course your client's preferences if uh, you happen to be making it for somebody else. Do you plan on making a leather round box? Uh, that's an interesting question. I've already a course on box making. Uh, which was a square box with a quilted lambskin lining and an alligator, raised alligator micro trunk handle on the top, um, which I'll link to on YouTube. Well, I'll show you a picture of it. But that was, yeah, that was, that was rectangle, so not round. Um, I do get that question every so often. You're not the first to ask it. So if there are people watching this and you're like, yeah, I'd love to learn how to do uh, uh, make a, a, le a solid leather box, but uh, do a, um, a box stitch on the, on, on the exterior, then let me know in the comments below, and uh, same with you guys on YouTube, let me know in the comments. Uh, if it's something that a lot of people request, absolutely, I'll do it. But there is something very similar on the watch case course that I produced. Again, YouTube, I'll show you what that looks like. But that was very similar because it's you're stitching in using a box stitch, a cylinder around a form. So there is that there. So that's another option. But uh, if people are interested in actually making like a box, like a hat box or something quite traditional, then yeah, I'd be more than happy to do that. Personally, I only use vegetable tanned leather. Yeah. If I had to use one, I'd, I'd probably, probably pick vegetable tanned leather because it's a joy to use. It's a bit of a purist thing. But I think it's horses for courses. I don't think it's uh, the perfect choice for absolutely everything, and neither is chrome tan. Delacy bags. Sorry if I'm pronouncing these names wrong because the camera is actually really far away. What is a good size creaser to start with for straps and wallets? Uh, assuming you're not using an electric edge creaser, I'd say probably 1.5 millimeter. Slightly, slightly big for watch straps. Um, pretty. Pretty good for wallets. Uh, small bags, usable. Large bags, you want to be going to 2.5 or more. Uh, but yeah, if I had to choose one, it would probably be 1.5. But if I had to choose one, it would be uh, an adjustable edge creaser. That way I can have an infinite number, because there is no number. Infinite adjustment. Will that stay on there? Yes, it will. Which glue to use when making a tranche card holder in order not to stitch every card slot? I think what you're talking about is uh, just card slots. I think that word is used by one particular artisan on Instagram and no one else in the world uses it. That, I, I don't believe that's the actual term, but, they, uh, but it sounds French. So. I don't think cutting a slit in leather is a, a, a French invention, but uh, sure. Um, so advice for using chrome tan leather with beige tan leather, that's done. Personal preference really is the answer. <clears throat> so what do you think about leather alternatives, vegan leathers, bee leaf, etc.? So what does someone who works full-time professionally with leather think of leather alternatives? Not a lot, to be honest. Um, I have tested them, I've tried them. I find they're left wanting. I don't think technology is there yet. I think they're not particularly durable, not particularly easy to work with. They don't cut the same, they don't skive the same, they don't stitch the same, and they don't have the same durability in my mind. Some of them can have a very high tensile strength, um, but 
so does polyester. I, I, I really think if, if you're, I think if you're vegan and you want to buy uh, vegan shoes, buy something that's made of a cloth or a canvas or something like that. Don't buy something that looks like leather because essentially you're advertising leather. So you're promoting the use of animal products by wearing something that looks so similar to an animal product. You know, um, so I think if, you, if you're going to go, non, go non-leather, go non-leather. I mean, if you look at Vuitton, for example, uh, Louis Vuitton have been making uh, coated canvas for almost two centuries, if not two centuries. Uh, and I think that's a viable alternative. I'd much rather have a waxed canvas bag a uh, duffel bag or something like that than a, a fake leather one. I th- I th- it just doesn't, it, ne- it never looks good either. It doesn't age well either. Um, but a good waxed canvas bag or something like that, I think looks great. It has that kind of rustic look to it. It can be, it's not necessarily something that will be used on formal occasions, but it looks great. It looks casual. It looks cool. Um, I would much rather use canvas and materials and, and fabrics if I left leather uh, rather than go after something that's uh, trying to be something that it's not. He it says it's a bit, of, a bit of an imposter material in my mind. Um, so yeah, that's what I think about it. Not much. Uh, question on here. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Uh, creation queer William Thoron says, what kind of handle do you advise to hold heavy things in a closer box? Um, well, what kind of handle would I advise for heavy things in general? Uh, probably a, like a briefcase style handle, something that you would have on luggage. That would probably be my go-to choice. Something with a reinforcement, maybe with a, a spring steel insert on the inside to, to handle higher loads. That's probably what I would uh, use. How do you, uh, sorry, Turnkey Leather says, how do you eliminate pocket stretch when using Shell Cordovan for wallet or card holder pro- pockets? Okay, I'll tell you something now. I'm glad you asked that because I've had this before where people have been panicking and they've sent me images and their customers are unhappy. That, um, and I'll go through this at the expense of a question here for time. I've had people send me going, I'm freaking out. My customer sent me an image of cards falling out the pockets of their card holder or their wallet that I made with vegetable tan leather with shell cordovan and token old edges and all that kind of thing. The thing with vegetable tan leather and a lot of leathers in general is you're going to get some stretch. The leather will conform. Sometimes this is a good thing. Okay, for example, when you're breaking in a new pair of shoes, they start getting a little bit wider, creasing in certain areas, they're starting to mold to the shape of your foot. And that's a desirable attribute of that kind of leather. Um, When you have a handle and it starts to take the like little dimples from your hands from years of holding it, it makes it more comfortable, it breaks into your hand, it's a desirable attribute. But when it comes to storing cards in a card slot, If you have more than one card in a, say, a vegetable tan leather card slot, then when you only ever have one card, that card slot has molded and stretched and adjusted to two cards. So when you have one card, what's going to happen when you turn it upside down? It's going to fall out. A lot of the time, this can happen when you have multiple cards in the same card slot. You take one out to use it at the cash register, and suddenly they're all falling out, and you're having to stuff one in. Or... You know, you, maybe you have a few cards in there that are business cards and you go through, oh, I don't need that anymore. And you take a couple out. Well, that leather has conformed to that particular use. It's done its job, right? It's done what it naturally wants to do. It's stretched. So if you store more than one card in a card slot, then cards are going to fall out if you store less cards. So that's just something you need to be aware of. How do you get around that? If you make a... Uh, turned edge at the top of your card slot. So you're using thin leather and you thin it down again and you put a non-stretch tape underneath and then turn it over. Okay, you can even make it double long, fold it in the center and then you have at the top like a, a nylon or polyester non-stretch tape. That makes a big difference. It doesn't make it perfect, but it definitely helps. But it will just make it very hard to stick more than one card in there depending on how your tight your tolerances are. So there are pros and cons to this. Um, 
you know, it's very simple card holders are great, but the downside is leather conforms, leather stretches, and if you start storing more than one card in there, they can fall out. Um, and that's not something you want to say on your, you know, you know, when you're trying to sell a product to your customer. Oh yeah, by the way, don't store more than one card in there because they all fall out. Well, I've got lots of cards. What am I supposed to do? It's something to be very aware of. Um, the answer would be to make a larger wallet with more space to store them or use a thinner leather with a turned edge at the top and underneath to that turned edge is sandwiched uh, a non-stretch tape which is then stitched in along the side seams so that it can't stretch. It makes it more difficult to store more cards in there um, so it will deter your customers from doing that. Um, so, But that will usually help the issue of cards falling out. All right, cool. Right, so let's move on to the next question. How much time do we have? Right, okay. What do you think about leather alternatives? Uh, not much is the answer to that. Overview of non-leather linings. Oh, going uh, another non-leather. So an overview of non-leather linings, canvas, silk, linen, etc. An overview, um, not really uh, sure where to take this, but I do like using canvas, uh, linen. I haven't used silk before. I would like to explore that. Um, I'm not sure how it would be inside the lining. It would need to be quite a, a thick silk, maybe with a, a cotton material backing or something like that to give it a bit more stretch and so stop it from being um, too soft on the inside. Uh, and I don't think it will be, even though silk is quite strong because it's usually so thin, uh, it might need a backing, but for canvas and linen, and of course you can make linen canvas. Canvas is just a coarse style of weave, that's it. Um, but linen and canvas, I do think it really does bring a, a, a lightness to leather goods um, and a more casual feel to leather goods. So maybe a little less luxury, high-end, fine leather craft, a little bit more relaxed, but with fine craftsmanship and detail, you can kind of bring that back, that uh, air of luxury, but it's, I, I really do enjoy a travel bag with a, a canvas lining. I think it looks really cool and very durable as well. And uh, yeah, what is the name given to these specific card slots? Uh, card slots. <laughs> I don't think there is, it's just a cut card slot. Uh, I'm not aware of an industry standard term. I've heard uh, many variations, but no uh, consensus. Uh, I don't think anybody has a name for them. Uh, Turnkey Leather says, how do you like the 40 degree chisel angle of the crimson irons versus the 45 of most other tool makers? I've never used uh, crimson hides irons before, unfortunately. Um, Robbie Borgman says, do I need to buy a skyving machine? No one needs to buy a skyving machine. Um, it's just, if your production level is at a point where it would make absolute sense to speed up your production, uh, employ a skyving machine, buy a skyving machine for sure. If you're making money from, uh, from your leather craft projects and in order to make more and produce more, you need to speed up some process that's um, slowing you down, a skyving machine. If you wanna make products where small pieces can be split down thinner to make your projects better, finer and sell for a higher price, buy a skyving machine. Uh, outside of that, um, I, I would recommend buying a skyving machine when you need it, not when you want it. All right, so let's move on to the next one. So an overview of non-leather linings, canvas, silk, linen, etc. I think it brings a nice uh, contrast in there. It brings a lightness to your work uh, and also a durability. So four more questions to go. How long did it take you to develop your skills at the level you wanted to work at? An interesting question. How long did it take? So this, this question starts with an, uh, an assumption. And that assumption is that I have arrived where I want to be already. Craftsmanship is a, a, a different mentality and I'll go into that a little bit more in the next question. But craftsmanship is problem finding, problem solving. Some people have, have, have defined craftsmanship as, but it's also the pursuit of perfection with the knowledge that you'll never actually get there and being okay with it. Because 
Craftsmanship is all about refining, refining, refining. Craftsmanship isn't a thing, it's a mentality. It's a philosophy. It's a way of life. It's a way of working. It's a way of thinking. Craftsmanship is all about honing your skills all the time. And the only way to do that is to constantly have a beginner's mind, is always being curious, always thinking, how can I make this better? How can I make this finer? How can I improve this? What would make this just elevate just a little bit more? How can I improve the quality of this? Where can I find something that would work better for this? It's always that constant um, mentality of, of small, regular increment uh, improvements. And that to, to me is, is craftsmanship. So how long did it take me to get to where I want to work at? Well, I, I, I never will. That's the thing, it's a never ending process. And that's the beauty of it. Some people find that frustrating that they'll never actually reach perfection because perfection doesn't really exist. Um, but some people find that absolutely fine. It's the journey rather than the destination. That's essentially what it is. So how long did it take you to develop your skills to the level what you wanted to work at? I haven't got there and I never will and I'm okay with it. So that is that to me is the fun. So one from uh, Kamazots, sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, how to pull you recommend me to make cowhide waterproof after dyeing? Would linseed oil work? Uh, linseed oil uh, has been used actually for centuries because it, it actually turns into a more, like, a more of a gum substance when it dries or when it oxidizes rather. Um, so more like a varnish, but it also prevents the leather from breathing. So anything that truly makes a leather waterproof also stops it from breathing, also stops it from being conditioned and more likely to crack. If you need something that's waterproof, you, you don't generally choose leather. No one would make uh, an umbrella out of, of a thin skin, you know, even if it could take the stretch. Uh, it's you use the right product for the right use. Um, so how can you truly make, you can only ever really make it water resistant. So waxes, um, you know, buying leather that's already waxed and heavily oiled, English bridal leather being one of them. But generally speaking, anything that will make it waterproof usually ends up making it dry out as well. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't generally recommend linseed oil. Um, you know, I've used it or something similar on here, um, China wood oil, tongue oil, um, but it, it's not a product that needs flexing. It's just a strop, just to firm it up a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend on putting something on your leather that stops it from breathing or being conditioned. Remember, leather can get wet as long as it's not undyed, untreated vegetable tan leather where it gets kind of water spots. Leather can get wet and also can dry out, it doesn't rot. So Yes, you know, you can have a leather bag and it, it got a bit wet. Just let it dry naturally. Don't put it near a radiator or a heat source. Just let it dry out naturally. It'll be absolutely fine. So, you know, if you're making a product for use in wet environments, I wouldn't use uh, leather in the, uh, in the beginning. So another one, uh, Angry Man um, says, <laughs> uh, will, will you give us the pleasure to hearing new podcasts? I love the one with the story of the three craftsmen. <laughs> uh, yeah, what you're listening to right now and your question on the podcast is currently being listened to by someone pounding the treadmill. Right, three more questions. How are we doing? We're okay, We've got 15 minutes. What is the best lighting setup for a workshop besides sunlight? Now this is a really good one, okay? This is a, a, a smart question. Uh, not a lot of people consider it and at one point I didn't consider it and I made a mistake because of it. And I'll, I'll explain the situation. So I was in a workshop once and most of the time I use photography lights designed for videography, photography and that kind of thing. And I switched because they were bulky. I switched, and this is the old workshop to uh, strip lighting. Okay, like a T8 uh, long strip light and fluorescent. And I was, making a project it was a briefcase and I was redoing the handle and I was redoing the handle to match the case itself because the original case the original handle was absolutely completely knackered it was perished it was done there was no way that you could repair it the leather was literally crumbling away in my hands it was like dust um, 
So I redid the handle, remade it, took it apart, exact measurements. It was the absolute doppelganger, it was really good. Put it on there and then I dyed it in situ. So as it was on, I, was, I dyed it, finished it, done everything to it. And I, looking at it, the color of the handle perfectly matched the color of the case. Slightly lighter on the handle because you have to remember that as leather ages, it gets darker. So if you make them an exact match, the handle will start overtaking in uh, the case in darkness. I digress. Um, but anyway, the, the color itself was, was perfect. The warmth, the saturation, everything was right. Took it outside for the first time in broad daylight. It was the middle, middle of the summer. And I looked at it, I thought, that looks red. The handle looks red compared to the case. They're both dark brown, but this looks like a really reddish brown. And I went inside the house, turned the lights on, and it, it matched. Went outside again, I thought, this just, to my eye, maybe I'm being fussy, it just looks off, something's wrong. I can't, like how, and then I went back in the workshop, looked at it, no, it's fine. Went outside, what you're experiencing there is known as color rendering index or CRI. Sunlight is ideal because it gives your eye the perfect sense of color, depth, saturation, all that kind of thing. When you use artificial light, like you know strip lights, certain fluorescent lighting, fluorescent light is probably the worst, uh, LEDs, incandescent bulbs, traditional bulbs have a good CRI rating, but uh, you know fluorescent tubes are the absolute worst. They're usually around 70 to 80 on the index. If you're making a workshop from scratch and you want to have good lighting in there, make sure that you're working with 90 or ideally 95 CRI or above, which is going to give your eyes the most accurate view of the colors and comparisons as possible, as close to sunlight as possible. I don't think it exists to have a CRI of 100. I don't know if incandescent bulbs can get there or they do get there. They might do. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, fluorescent bulbs are probably the worst for that. And that's what I was experiencing. So I went out and I actually saw the true colors and the true colors were off. I managed to fix it again and it, it worked out perfectly, but um, it, it was just a pain. And I'd, I'd never even thought about it. So when someone asked me, you know, what's the best lighting setup? Uh, a, a very high color rendering index. And that's usually gonna be seen on lights that are designed for photography or videography because they understand that they, you need the right light for your camera to pick up uh, the best possible uh, accurate colors. Uh, Top Leather says, I do not understand your language, but I follow you live because your work is extremely beautiful. Um, being as you wrote that perfectly with the correct uh, punctuation and use of capital <laughs> letters, I'm beginning to wonder if you uh, actually do speak English. Uh, because if you put that through Google Translation, it ain't, it ain't that good yet. <laughs> Maybe you have an English friend writing it for you, perhaps. All right, so what's the best lighting setup? Anything with a high CRI index. I would also like to say, try and have lights coming from different angles. So I've got them from here, from here, from there, from there. And the idea is when I put my hand down or pricking iron, yes, you'll see some small shadows here and there, but they're not very powerful shadows. If you have a strong light source coming from one direction only, you're gonna get strong shadows and it can throw your eyes off a little bit. Um, so when you're aligning a pricking iron to a very you know, faint line that you've made with your wing dividers with incorrect lighting, um, you know, a shadow cast over there can make your stitches off. You know, and people are wondering, am I holding at the wrong angle? Is it the wrong pricking iron? Am I just not good at leather craft? No, it's the lighting. Sometimes the most simple things are the culprit. So, <laughs> Top leather's laughing right now. Right, so a few more minutes left. How have we got? Uh, less than 10 minutes. What is the difference between handmade and craftsmanship? And I kind of alluded to this uh, in an earlier question. What's the difference between handmade and craftsmanship? Handmade is as it sounds. It was made with someone's hand or mostly with someone's hand. Unfortunately, I don't think there's an industry definition written down anywhere where there's a certain standard when you cannot say that it's handmade. If your, someone's hands touched it, I think technically in the industry, if you push leather through a sewing machine, it was hand sewn. I don't believe you can say hand stitched, but I believe you can say it's hand sewn. But if you put it in a machine, clamp it down, press go, and it does the entire thing for you, I don't think you could say it. But 
I, I don't think there's like an industry standard. You can't say this, you can say that. I could, could be completely wrong. Um, but I mean, handmade, I mean, if, you're, if your kid makes you a macaroni picture with school glue uh, and tissue paper, it's handmade, right? But it's not necessarily craftsmanship. So craftsmanship, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a, a different mentality. Craftsmanship is always looking for problems and trying to fix them, always trying to find better ways of doing things always honing and honing and honing and honing and improving and looking at things with an eye of making them better. That's how uh, beautiful cars are made. That's how beautiful leather goods are made. That's how beautiful watches are made. Uh, it's, it's an eye of how can we make this better? How can we make it more efficient? How can we make it smoother? How can we decorate it better? Uh, how can we change something just to elevate it that little bit more all the time? That's craftsmanship. Because you can have something that's terribly handmade, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily call it craftsmanship. Like some, someone might make a wallet or a bag and say, you know, it's not perfect, the stitching isn't perfect and the edges aren't great, but you know what? That's how you can tell it's handmade. Yeah, that's handmade, but that's not necessarily craftsmanship. Craftsmanship is a very different mentality where you wouldn't even consider selling that in the first place. That's the craftsman's mindset. Um, it has to be to a certain standard and that standard is always being raised. So to me, that's the difference between handmade and craftsmanship. One is the description, one is a way of life. Last question, last question with the remaining time that we have is how to properly store hides to prevent mold growth and not lose the natural smell of leather. Okay, so how do you store hides and leather itself to prevent mold growth and not lose the natural smell of leather. Now, I don't think leather is naturally antifungal um, or, or uh, mold proof, but it has natural antifungal properties due to the tannage. So if you're managing to get mold on your leather, I mean, I've seen pictures of it, but I've never actually experienced it. So I think you'd have to probably be, be storing your leather in a very dark place that can't breathe, so it's contained, usually in a plastic container or something, where it's got damp somehow. So it's usually under some extreme circumstances, I think, for that to happen. I don't think it's very easy. The way I store leather in general, big sheets, big hides of stiff leather, I would try and store them flat, if possible, on a rack, okay? Or over, I think you call it, um, what's the word now? something horse, okay, it's just like a, a sheet of um, like a, a flexible plywood that goes over a, fr a frame like so with probably eight to ten millimeter radius on it so that the leather kind of like naturally hangs over each side and you can stack them quite high um, and it uh, keeps them relatively flat, it's, it makes it store a smaller footprint but ideally if you can, maybe under a workshop table, just have a, a thin shelf across the, the large table where you can store them flat. That's the ideal. For skins, you can, you can wrap them up and I like to store them in cardboard tubes. Cardboard tubes are ideal because they're, they're usually quite inexpensive and also it allows them to breathe a little bit more. Um, I had a friend who used to live locally, he's, he's uh, moved up north now, a uh, French guy, leather craftsman, and uh, he used to have a, a leather craft shop in Hong Kong, actually, funnily enough, but um, I should contact him again, see how he is. Anyway, I went to his place once and um, he, he stored his leather inside plastic sheeting, which was then inside uh, large plastic pipes, okay? I think they were ABS pipes or something like that. And he was like, oh yeah, I got some really nice leather to show you, got some really nice leather. And uh, he pulled it out, opened the bag, and the smell that came off it was just so bad. It smelled like the, the, the oils had gone rancid. It just really ponged really badly. I was like, what's that smell? It's just like, oh, I don't know. It's just how it is. Like, Did it smell like that when you bought it? And he said, oh, I can't remember. I was like, I think you'd remember if it smelled like that. Um, I said, you need to op open it out, let it breathe at least. Um, so I, I have seen where leather stored poorly has caused a negative impact, but I've never actually seen mold on anything. So I've got some questions on here. Um, 
Your top class pal, love your attention, eye for detail, great listen to you all. Well done, thank you very much. Uh, in French, une chevalet, 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 I don't know. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences with us, you're making the world beautiful. <laughs> it's a nice way of describing it, thank you very much, it's very kind of you. Uh, so how to properly store hides, ideally thick hides that don't wanna bend and conform too much. Uh, ideally, if you can, uh, store them uh, on the flat or at least on the bend uh, for smaller skins such as you know calf soft calf skin uh, chrome tan leathers uh, small animals goat skin lamb skin things like that uh, you can wrap them up personally I like to wrap them grain side out which not a lot of people do but grain side in can cause lateral creasing so if you leave a skin rolled up tightly inside something or even not rolled tightly um, these little tiny horizontal creases along the hide can be uh, quite apparent when you unravel it and open it. So I like to have it so the grain side is on the outside, so it's stretched rather than compressed. And then I wrap it in brown paper so it can breathe and it's inside cardboard tube. So again, it can breathe and moisture doesn't build up and uh, cause any issues. So we are out of time. Uh, thank you for your questions, guys. Thank you for those who reached out. Apologies if I didn't get your questions done in here. Uh, last quick question here. Is there any is there any leather which looks the same from both sides? Yeah, I mean, a very well-finished English bridal leather will look the same both sides, uh, usually resin-backed. So you know, like sometimes you have uh, split leather that's finished with polyurethane or resin over the top to make it look like the grain layer. You can use that process for the rear side of leather. So one is like a, almost a, a pretend grain and one is the actual real grain. Um, you'll see that a lot, a lot on uh, mostly vegetable tanned leathers, I believe. I don't know of any chrome tan that are double finished, but I don't see why not. But it wouldn't breathe very well because uh, a heavy pigment layer like um, resin, like uh, polyurethane or something, doesn't allow leather to breathe very well. So a double layer would probably dry out very quickly. But yes, uh, a lot of good quality English bridal leathers can be finished both sides if they're struck through or dyed through completely. Okay. First time listener, enjoyed the Q&A. Ah, good stuff, it's also on YouTube and it will also be uh, a podcast on leathercraftmasterclass.com so don't forget to go there as well. Cool, right, thanks for joining guys. Appreciate the questions, appreciate you joining in and asking questions and being active. It's also always good when I get a lot of questions in here as well and there's a little bit of an interaction as, uh, with us which is quite nice as well. All right, so thank you for joining me. Don't forget, go to leathercraftmasterclass.com because right now there's an offer to get a free video which explains everything you need to know about selecting your leathers, what leathers to choose, how to buy them, and how to test them, which is very important. But also there's a bonus article which is 20 pages uh, called the Tool Buyer's Guide, which as it says, will help you to select the right tools to get you started. And it's a tiered system, so if you're a beginner, intermediate or advanced, you can then select what tools you need for each stage. So that is available right now, leathercraftmasterclass.com and follow the button that says, are you new here? And then click that and you'll see it. All right guys, thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time again, next month, same time. See you then, take care.